Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Elasticolor Coatings, High Performance Protection and Durable Color Design. There's a small bit of housekeeping to cover before we start. Your phones are on mute. If you have any questions, please type them into the question and answer box in the corner of your screen and we'll answer them at the end of our session, time permitting, or we'll answer them via email after. And you can always send questions to mapaydigital at mapay.com. Now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Rankin Jays. Rankin is the business development leader for coatings for Mapay's concrete restoration systems line. He has spent virtually his entire career in the paint and coatings industry with a great deal of international experience across all facets of the business. During his career in the United States, he has been responsible for channel sales, marketing, and project management for several regional and national brands. Rankin's been a business development leader with MAPE since 2015. He holds a BS in psychology and an MBA from universities in New Zealand, and we're happy to have him here with us today. Rankin, the floor is yours. Appreciate it, Jen. Thank you so much for the intro, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here this afternoon, and I'm welcoming everybody um, out there on, on, on the line um, um, listening in, and thank you very much. Um, yeah, I spent most of my life in the coatings industry, and uh, being from New Zealand, it wouldn't be a surprise to tell you that the time I wasn't in the coatings industry, um, I worked for an import export company uh, moving kiwi fruit. So there we are. There's a little bit of humour uh, behind my uh, in my background. So um, moving ahead, then uh, to my next favourite topic of uh, oh, actually, I'm sorry, I've just had a little bit of a glitch here. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, moving next to my next favorite topic uh, from my career path is actually um, coatings, paints and coatings. And today, as Jen mentioned, high performance protection and durable color design is the uh, is the topic. Um, so I just want to set the stage a little bit and talk about paints and coatings. And those two terms are used very much interchangeably, and even I fall into the same trap. But uh, you know, to some people, paints are just a color on the walls. Uh, of their uh, of their home or on their car, um, well, coatings really become more commonly associated with specialized applications such as waterproofing and corrosion protection. Both coatings and paints are a very complex combination of raw materials applied in a in a liquid form and through a variety of uh, chemical processes become solid. And we generally apply coatings for protection, decoration, identification, sanitation. But really, I believe that. What cuts through all of that is the need for protection. Um, you know, at the very least, maybe uh, some of these other things are a secondary benefit, but ultimately we're looking to protect that substrate. And that's really because the building materials we employ are dynamic substrates. They undergo some structural and chemical change over time. These changes will be accelerated as a result of entrained installation or design faults, um, environmental and climatic conditions, seismic activity, or just wear and tear on the uh, on the substrate uh, without regular maintenance. You know, we've come a long way with some of these building materials and we identify that, you know, steel performs better if we have it um, galvanized at the at the plant, or you see some reinforcing these days with uh, epoxy coating on it to um, retard the corrosion as it's set in concrete, or even the, uh, the concept of um, pressure treating lumber or, or glazing brick, all, intended to help promote the uh, the service life of these materials. Um, but when we look at paints and coatings, more so than paint, a coating is really designed to uh, protect those substrates from inevitable aging process. Commercial standards, again, set the stage here um, about this environmental degradation of our, of our, our, our uh, building structures. And you know it's obvious that commercial centers have been built up around traditional ports of entry and transportation routes. So it's natural to expect that these have evolved into major population centers. And it's a little known trivia fact here that you know 39% of the US population actually lives in uh, a county bordered by a coastline. If you sort of expand that net a little bit, 64% of us actually live in coastal states. So somewhere between one third and two thirds of the population live in what we consider to be a severe coastal environment. 
and that's characterized by high chloride precipitation. This is wet uh, uh, chloride precipitation as a result of, the, uh, of rainfall washing uh, chloride ions out of the atmosphere. These areas are also subject to high coastal winds. And now you've got wind-driven rain, wind-driven salt-laden sea air, very corrosive. And then, of course, high rainfall in these areas. Now you've got wind-driven rain to contend with as well. And then, of course, as we look at the look at these uh, population centers again, um, these are culprits of uh, producing the heat island effect, where the cities um, heated during the day have insufficient time, uh, well, capture so much heat, uh, they have insufficient time to cool down overnight. So we create this heat island and high concentrations of airborne pollutants, CO2 emissions, they're all contributing to the damaging environmental conditions that already exist. So protecting our buildings and infrastructure really requires a robust system, you know, designed and tested to withstand these conditions. So changing focus a little bit then to concrete or, or masonry specifically, because it's really the largest, uh, the, the, the most widely used building product uh, that we have. And concrete specifically is, um, will remain both permeable and porous and subject to deterioration as a result of the presence of moisture in the structure. Um, the pores within the, uh, within the concrete and the capillary action, um, there's always water or water vapor um, at a, fit, a relatively high level within the concrete substrate. So um, moisture is a root cause of, or a key contributing factor to con uh, concrete deterioration. You know, things like chloride ingress, uh, ASR, free store, sulfate attack, um, they all require the presence of moisture or to act as a vehicle to transport soluble ions into the concrete matrix. You know, in my view, best concrete is painted concrete, um, treated and waterproofed to protect against this moisture in, uh, infiltration, um, allow the concrete to um, inhale and exhale the water vapor, um, but also protect against CO2 diffusion. And of course, above, uh, you know, of all of the above grade waterproofing solutions, coatings will actually satisfy more of the demands of concrete deterioration than, than any other process of protection. Um, so selecting the right application, selection of the, um, an application, the right coating system uh, can mitigate a lot of these adverse effects. It'll compensate for some of the defects in placement, overcome some of the inherent problems in concrete. And it is actually quite a challenging building material to work with from the point of view of uh, designing and coating. We need to have it breathable, uh, waterproof. We need to um, have it produce the ability for it to bridge cracks. Um, and then some examples here is, uh, you know, the cracking is obvious, but dusting on the surface uh, through overwatering during the curing process um, creates this dusting, which is uh, in effect a bond breaker between the coating and the, and the substrate. Freshly poured concrete is, or, or stucco is a, a very high um, alkalinity of about 13. And um, without the right product applied, you can end up with alkali burn where the uh, certain elements within the, the, the uh, uh, paint formulation or coating formulation can be turned to soap as a result of that very basic environment. So not, not all coatings are created equal. So it's important to understand some of the uh, performance claims and interpretation so we can actually design you the right, um, and, and you can specify the, the right system for your project. You know, coatings do satisfy a higher performance standards as I mentioned, um, and generally have the testing credentials to prove it. Architectural and decorative coatings, pretty much fully matured, commoditized, there are very few differentiators, and consumers are really more aligned by their distribution channel and store type. You know, you and I buy our house paint at, uh, at, at the big box store or the hardware store. Um, contractors typically gravitate towards the, uh, the, uh, the company stores um, where, they can, uh, um, where they can enjoy some credit. Um, meanwhile, for these high performance coatings, we're generally working through um, specialty building product distribution points. So, and it, it becomes obvious when you look at the, 
the house painted with house paint on the left and that condominium painted with a high performance coating on the left. You're not, those are not the same products used in those, uh, in those two scenarios. But having said that, paints and coatings do actually, they're joined at the hip. They are, uh, they're, they're actually formed on the four same basic principles. They consist of a binder, pigment, solvent, and additives. Binder is the, uh, the, the resin. It, uh, it's the glue that holds all the pigment particles together. It's the glue that sticks the, sticks the coating to the wall at the end of the day. Uh, pigment provides us with the color and the hiding and the, uh, you know, the, the visual appeal of the, of the coating. Uh, we can use it to control glass and sheen. Um, and we can also uh, tweak pigments to impart certain performance and application attributes as well. Meanwhile, solvents are our vehicle, you know, in a water-based paint, the vehicle is actually water. And this obviously flashes off as the coating dries or evaporates. And the additives are in there to enhance certain properties like um, flow and leveling, defoaming, scuff resistance, et cetera. But at the end of the day, the what's out of all of that concoction, what's left on the wall is the solid component of the binder, which is typically clear, a, 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 you know, a thin resinous film. And that has basically encapsulated the pigment. So those are basically the only two things left on the wall after the paint's dried. And to talk about pigments a little bit more, and this is where we get into the durable color design piece of the conversation. Uh, primary pigments uh, provide the color and the hiding and provide the coating with the opacity uh, necessary to hide the under, underlying substrate. Titanium dioxide is the biggie that's in uh, basically every white paint we, uh, we see out there. Colored pigments, by contrast, are classified as organic or inorganic, depending on the chemistry, and incorporated into coatings as a powdered form. Uh, during the uh, manufacturing process or as part uh, or as a uh, liquid dispersion that we see them squirting from a tinting machine into into the can of paint at the uh, at the point of sale I'll make the point that there are probably very few manufacturers out there these days that will actually um, grind uh, powdered pigment and use that as a dispersion um, at the fact on the factory floor you know the uh, the uh, the inventory, well, uh, the cost of the inventory really and sales really don't support holding that inventory of ready mixed colors. So uh, generally speaking, you know, I'd say 99.9% .9 of our, our paints we see in the marketplace these days are all tinted at point of sale. The organic colors, colorants are generally uh, brighter colors. They have poor durability and uh, generally poor hiding power as well. Um, you know, through no fault of the manufacturing of the product, but that's just nature of the pigment. Inorganic pigments are uh, generally derived from uh, metal oxides and produce the um, light, uh, more uh, light stable earth tones or, or oxides. But unfortunately, the, uh, you know, our, 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 our commerce uh, utilizes a lot of uh, these organic colors um, to, to highlight their to highlight their buildings to um, invoke certain emotional responses from us as well um, and it's these colors and, and I know you, you you probably heard people talking about oh that red doesn't hide very well or that yellow's very poor or look how it's faded over time these are these are perfect examples of those applications and 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 obviously presents a challenge to the coatings manufacturers paint and coatings manufacturers to how do we combat this and how we how do we combat that stigma of having a, a poorly hiding product or a, a poorly fading product. So there are a couple of couple of things but paint manufacturers will seldom support the use of these colors. Um, if you look at their fan decks, um, you'll see that they're making specific exclusions because of the sensitivity of some of these pigments. They'll say, hey, this is just for inside use only or not recommended for exterior use. Um, and that's largely because these point of sale liquid tint systems are a cost performance compromise. There are a lot more durable um, uh, pigmentation options out there, but the cost of installing those across 5,000 tinting machines, if you're, if you're one of the national paint companies, um, just to have it used occasionally, it just doesn't make sense. So what we try and do is have a 
you know, have a compromise, have find that happy medium where it's not going to cost us an absolute fortune to tint somebody's red paint if they're not going to be doing a, uh, you know, well, painting the whole firehouse, for instance. Um, commercial coatings manufacturers, by contrast, and as I said earlier, we don't have as many distribution points that we would have to um, populate with with those high cost colorants. So we, as a, as a commercial coatings manufacturer, can take extra steps to offer more durable solutions with higher cost inorganic solutions. And I'll, I'll show you, give you some examples here. But the root cause of photo degradation is uh, as a result of exposure to radiation in forms of UVA, UVB, visible light spectrum, and the near IR. And you can see I've laid out the uh, the, uh, the spectrum down there in, in increasing or decreasing wavelengths. You know, the, the further down the, the uh, spectrum you go, the, 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 the higher the frequency, the, the greater the energy. And that energy is absorbed by the chromophores within a pigment molecule. And it generate, we can't destroy energy. It's the, uh, it's the law of uh, thermodynamics, I think, that uh, says we can't destroy energy, we can convert it. And this energy is actually converted to heat uh, and is sufficient to break the molecular bonds, um, thereby changing the color properties of that pigment. So uh, as that happens, obviously it, it changes color and you say, oh, well, it's, it's faded or it's changed color. But heat also plays a role in the accelerated aging and damaging to the, uh, and damage to the binder um, that's providing that protection, that resinous protection to the, the, to the pigment. You see the example of the, uh, the red sports car on the right there. That's not necessarily photodegradation of the pigment. That's actually more the breakdown of the clear coating that's been applied to the uh, to the red base coat. So to restore that, it's actually nothing more nothing more difficult than giving you a light a light sand to remove some of that uh, some of the clear coat residue and put down a new clear coat, and that will be restored to look exactly like it is on the left side because they've used a very high quality red pigment there that is actually um, very light stable. Um, you know, we can we can take steps to mitigate color fading. Um, UV inhibitors, for example, in a, in a clear coat like that, in a clear coat situation like that. And then of course, um, choosing inorganic colorants or, or pigments over the organic pigments. Um, and a, a higher sheen finish also helps with that uh, with that durability. But it's interesting to note that, you know, red is is the one that we always come back to and um, always complain about the lack of hiding or gee, that fades fast. And that's largely because it's 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 out there on the right hand end of the uh, the visible sp light spectrum. So red is absorbing all of that UVA, UVB, more so than the other colors on in the visible light spectrum to the left. It, it's absorbing all of the visible light spectrum as well, plus it's first in line for all of the um, near IR radiation as well. So it's actually being bombarded more than any other color in the spectrum with, with uh, that much more radiation. So that's essentially why, why reds are problematic, particularly. As I mentioned, gloss of the paint film can protect, um, can protect, the, the, resin, uh, protect the pigment particles. And this cross section of a paint film is, a, I think, is a good example. You can see there on the left where the all the pigment particles are um, immersed, saturated, and uh, below the surface of the uh, surface of the paint film. Now the the, um, the resin, as I said, is typically they 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 just dry clear. So we we're relying on the uh, on the binder uh, on the pigments to uh, produce that uh, produce that opacity, but. Um, with that, they don't provide particularly good hiding as you're applying a gloss finish. So the way we compensate for, for hiding is adding or increasing the pigment volume concentration of the PVC. So the, the cross section of the film becomes more cluttered with, with uh, a higher percentage of uh, pigmentation. Um, as we add more and more pigmentation to the, to the, uh, to the formulation, you start seeing the pigment floating on top of the paint film. And of course, incident light waves now start scattering and it gives you the impression of a, a flatter finish. So 
that's how we adjust the gloss. Um, but of course, a flat paint film, the pigment's sitting right there on top. It's first to be uh, it's first to be attacked by UVA, UVB, and uh, and the other uh, light source energy. So it is actually going to start breaking down faster than, for example, the gloss. The other interesting thing to note here is perhaps the permeability that as we increase the pigment volume concentration of the coating, um, we get more voids between the pigment particles. So in a roundabout way, that's actually how we allow our coatings to breathe, particularly on a, on a concrete facade where we, where we, uh, where we, 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 we're subject to uh, a lot of vapor drive. Um, a flat coating is going to provi provide you a lot more of that um, breathability to the coating as opposed to a, a gloss finish. So that, that's a, a nice little aside there in terms of uh, the advantages of having a, uh, a high PVC product. Going back to our red examples for a minute and uh, talk to you a little bit about why uh, or what What's, what's entailed here? There are over uh, 200 different red pigments listed in the color index, and they each have an individual hue and a unique crystalline structure. So identifying that color index of a paint or coating pigment, um, it provides clues on the durability. And what I've listed out here is the um, number one, two, and three, in my estimation, uh, of the liquid point of sale tinting systems that are out there in the field. Uh, these are the manufacturers, um, and they've adopted these these uh, pigments or pigment blends for paint and coatings manufacturers to install in their in their tin system. So, but they're all based on a on a specific pigmentation. Take for example the uh, the Clarion Colonels uh, the Scarlet. It's a very pretty bright red, um, and it's based on uh, pigment 168. Um, fairly good solids, but provide some very good light fastness on a on a on a on a one to five scale. Um, but this is where we, we we run into the problem with reds is that it is actually quite it is quite transparent or semi transparent. So the multiple coats required. And we've heard that oh you, I need to put three four five coats of this red on for it to cover. Uh, and th this is partly the reason. You know, the next on the list there is um, Nova Color. This manufactured by ColorCore uh, in the U.S. Unfortunately, they're um, not giving us a lot of clues. They're just telling us it's a blend of some certain pigments. So we don't really have a good handle on how well that hides. And they'll be pretty upfront and telling you, well, it's it, it's it's probably the best one out there. Well, the best one out there is actually the one at the bottom. If you look at PR254. Um, and it should be, uh, well, it might, might come to as a, a bit of a surprise that that's also referred to as Ferrari red. Um, and that, that is actually for, for a stated reason. That was the, that pigment was actually um, synthesized, I'll try that again, synthesized for uh, Ferrari. It is, a, uh, it is just the best um, red pigment colorant, um, which is, excellent light fastness and semi-opaque. So this is going to give you the, the best hiding possible of any red out there. So unless, you know, it's pure pigment 254, nothing else is actually going to match up to that. So I'm sorry that blend that we're talking about a couple of lines up um, is not going to give you the best, the best performance of any red other than 254. So I, I think I've sort of stressed that, but you know, we can run this same assessment of um, other high-risk organic colorants like Hansa yellow or uh, phthalo blue and, and and green. That they, uh, you know, they they also subject to a lot of a lot of fading. So, you know, it's important to sort of understand this and uh, appreciate the fact that coatings manufacturers can actually uh, dial this in a lot better than um, the, the, the the mass distributed paint lines out there. Let's also talk a little bit about specifications. Um, you know, you might assume that because commercial construction is largely driven by precise specifications from architects and engineers, this would also be the case for the 9900 section, the paint section. Um, 
but you know may, maybe not um because there are some other um other issues there and you know we're not really talking about a structural element of a uh, of a of a building of a building it's it's the facade coating and really we're uh, i think a lot of people are more interested about the aesthetics rather than the performance but um you know the number of factors that sort of confound the industry and uh, you know one is specifications um it's it's from from my point of view it's um it it is confounding because um paint companies have more or less inherited access to commercial uh commercial coatings market legacy specifications from master spec or master format which have been around oh i, I think long before my time in the states but back into the uh, into the 90s um listed just show and williams glidden benjamin moore and ppg those were the four big national brands so prior to about well, 95, um, the methods of updating these systems was a diskette or CD in the mail. Uh, and it wasn't until, you know, late in the 90s where we got uh, faster, faster connections than uh, 28K dial-up that um, we could start updating these uh, specification manuals almost instantaneously with, with, uh, with new data, with alternative manufacturer options. And in 2003, there's a case in point, that master spec lowered the bar, well, lowered the barrier to entry by agreeing to have um, any master painter institute approved product um, listed as an equivalent. But you can see the these legacies, uh, legacy specifications drifting well into the 2000s. And right there on the right hand side, we've got a uh, list of uh, contents, uh, master format, 1995 copyright, um, but this this specification was being written in in 2012, and of course their part two products manufacturers just the big four again. So it, you can see that these 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 specifications, if they haven't been converted to house specs, are still are still out there. Here's, here's an example where MPI have been allowed to. Uh, be included as a as an equivalent with uh, with manufacturers listed on the MPI approved products list uh, for uh, this uh, this restoration in Miami. Um, but equally, that except I have there to the right, residential products are not permitted. So I think there's a you know the point I want to make here is that uh, you know it's broadly recognised that there's a differentiation between paints and coatings for commercial projects. But we as coatings manufacturers still have, obviously still have a lot of work to do. There are actually no unifying regulations within the coatings industry uh, to maintain quality standards. So basically what we're giving specifiers out there is, is what we say as manufacturers. You know, federal regulations focus on health and safety, consumer and environmental protection. And ASTM tests, uh, while they are the industry standard, they are inherent test method issues. Very few tests were originally designed for the coatings industry, and manufacturers can, you know, choose essentially whichever, whichever test method fits their need. Um, they can modify and uh, select preferences to reflect uh, real life coatings applications rather than following the strict, uh, uh, the strict application of the test procedure. And I'll show you some examples of what I mean by that. Um, you know, here we have uh, water vapor and permeants, obviously vitally important on a, on a, on a, on a concrete structure, even on a, uh, on a, on a timber frame uh, or a uh, wood cladding. Um, these substrates hold a lot of moisture and we, we, it's necessary to have this breathability in our, in our coating systems. But, um, you know, ASTM provide us with essentially uh, two different tests done two different ways. So we've got opportunity for four different tests. Um, only the 1653 uh, measures water vapor transmission and it's calculated from that water vapor permeance. But true permeability is only calculated using uh, ASTM E96. But unfortunately that test method requires a film thickness greater than half an inch to, uh, to, to, uh, to calculate permeability. So it's really not practical for an organic paint film. You know, permeability is really the only means to compare competing coatings of, of different thicknesses. 
and there's the there's the formula there. It's um, water vapor permeance derived from the ASTM D 1653 times the the film thickness. So it's um, the film thickness of the sample. So it's a very linear relationship. The more the thicker the coating, the less permeability. Uh, you know, here's another good example with the elongation and tensile strength. There are three different tests out there on the marketplace. They use the same um, same test apparatus, same test sample, um, but the the uh, the manner in which the test is operated. You know, the uh, the test head speed, the speed at which it's uh, elongated, uh, differs. There are a few other uh, idiosyncrasies in each of these tests, um, which means then one manufacturer tests ASTM D412, the other one test to 638 and they aren't actually comparable. The other issue we see here is that um, your test sample for uh, ASTM D412 requires a uh, sample three millimeters thick. That's about 10 times the normal application rate of a, uh, of a, uh, of a high build coating or an, even a paint. That's a, a paint film is typically about four mils. Um, so a coating typically about 10 mils dry. So you can see there that, yeah, that not really a true to life uh, extrapolation of the, of the of the test data is of, uh, as a, as applicable. And then waterproofing. We talk about waterproofing, but that really only applies to uh, a substrate that or a, uh, a a subject matter that is um, under hydrostatic pressure. It needs a a, a water head to produce hydrostatic pressure, then the coating needs to satisfy that. Uh, and by that means it becomes a waterproofing. So um, to talk about waterproofing coatings, it's for ab above grade, it's a little bit of a misnomer, but uh, it, I must say it's good marketing, a good marketing pitch nonetheless. Um, so what we really are talking about with facade coatings is um, weatherproofing or damp proofing. And that's where the wind driven rain test is, uh, is applied. And this just deluges your uh, test sample for 24 hours to simulate 98 mile an hour wind velocity. Um, you know, a good um, you know uh, a good breeze down here in Florida during hurricane season. Um, you know, and it's uh, a very very much a subjective um, test method, um, and not not a not a very good method for uh, comparing product. Simulated accelerated test weathering is awesome because it's it's really our uh, the automotive equivalent of our, you know, the crash test dummies. We, we put samples out there um, in accelerated weathering chambers, um, cycling them for thousands of hours, uh, trying to duplicate um, real life conditions. Unfortunately, not, not all failure modes are replicated, but um, in general terms, you know, uh, 3000 hours in a Xenon arc, um, utilizing that, um, the ASTM G155 test, gives you approximately a, a five year exposure in South Florida. But unfortunately, some manufacturers, once again, are, are publishing outdated um, outdated uh, test results or test credentials. And you can see there that these two examples were withdrawn 19 years ago. And I know for a fact that uh, uh, these two manufacturers have rewritten their data sheets. So why haven't they updated their, their test procedures and test methods? So whereabouts are you going to find all this information? It's it's right there on on uh, on manufacturers test uh, tech, technical data sheets, and I've got this comparison for you just to show you how we as a coatings company are trying to differentiate ourselves from from paint companies. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with showing one of locks on XP product or Benjamin Moore or it. They have great products and great companies and built multi billion dollar businesses, so they they've got to be doing stuff right. But when it comes to protecting a, a commercial facade, we really need to be stepping it up and providing our owners and our specifiers the very best product we can. And you know, here's here's a couple of examples utilizing our uh, high build acrylic coating. Um, we've gone to ex uh, an extra length to partner, well, not actually partner, but to sign on to the Sealant and Waterproofing Restoration Institute's um, uh, product validations. Um, where a third party lab is used to validate our test data. That what we've written on our test data sheet has actually been validated both by SWRI and a third party um, 
testing lab. So, you know, we, we can demonstrate here that we have higher perms, uh, um, very high perms relative to other, other coatings in the marketplace. Um, it will say, well, hang on a minute, Rankin, uh, what about 31.7 perms at, um, from Benjamin Moore? Well, that was actually applied at, uh, tested at 2.9 mils, um, three times less the thickness than elastic color coat. So, um, as I mentioned, permeability is a linear relationship between film thickness. So, no, actually, elastic color coat has better permeability per millage thickness. Uh, again, our, our, our tensile strength and elongation has been validated uh, by, by a third party. Uh, Wind-driven rain, um, I can tell you that, uh, again, looking at data sheets from our competitors, um, they actually show you the, go to the lengths of actually saying what's what the coating system or the paint system is required to pass this test. Sean Williams said it's a two-coat system. Benjamin Moore said it's a three-coat system. So by utilizing a coating in this instance, if wind-driven rain is, is one of your hot buttons, we could actually save you a, a lot of labor by utilizing a high performance coating rather than the, rather than the paint. Crack bridging, concrete cracks. Sooner or later, we know it's going to crack. So it, it's vital again to have a uh, have a product that demonstrates its ability to bridge these uh, static and dynamic cracks um, to provide you that continuous waterproof or, or weatherproof. Um, membrane across the facade. Change it up a notch. Okay, we've got some competition in the coatings environment now with BASF and Sika. Also great companies, great products, um, fearsome competitors, and uh, we, we go head to head with these guys every day. So, um, you know, again, looking at the comparison, and, you know, I will say that BASF and Seeker, particularly in the in the coatings area, have done themselves a disservice by by not maintaining their their tech data. Um, we're offering a, a, a higher permeability, um, you know, let's say equivalent elongation. But what we can trade up to here is the fact that we've um, we've had ours independently tested by a third party. So uh, you don't need to take our word for it, as opposed to our competitors. Uh, wind driven rain and, and it astounds me that we're the only one within this this group of uh, three manufacturers to actually offer this information again I, I think understanding the environmental conditions we're trying to protect against why wouldn't you have this test uh, again accelerated weathering um, you know uh, our competitive view to uh, or still using test data that's uh, 19 years old and you get the idea that you know we we've done our homework, we've done done uh, extra, gone the extra mile to produce um, to produce some uh, some really good performing product. Um, and then I'll just gloss over that. There's their uh, their data sheets, uh, just to just to prove the fact that they have the opportunity to update but have not. So, out of all of this. You know where where do we go to for 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 more information on on paints and coatings? Well, the industry has been wanting for standards, as I said. So, Master Painters Institute, um, uh, it's a mem my voluntary membership uh, can require some considerable financial commitment, um, but it has been adopted by uh, many of the uh, uh, government departments, um, Department of Education, Defence, and also adopted by Master Spec, oh. as I showed you in the example earlier. Um, they do. Uh, they do have a, their own uh, test criteria. Although the the uh, the bar height is not a not a stretch. It's not very high. Um, meanwhile, SWRI, uh, Zealand Water Roofing Restoration Institute. It's a national international trade association that's represented by uh, probably the best qualified contractors and design professionals in the industry. And they really strive to raise the bar on the uh, on the quality of the work performed. And rely on manufacturers to to support them in this in this uh, quest with with really good product. Um, and as I mentioned, they they validate through a third party uh, manufacturer's product claims. So if they don't meet if they don't meet the uh, the standard you say on your 
you're claiming for yourself on the tech data sheet, they don't pass. So with that, I just want to really um, look back and just introduce you a little bit to our uh, to our coatings line. Um, we provide all of our, our facade coatings are elastic color. That's a brand name. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're all elastomeric uh, because that actually has different connotations to different people. Um, and to some respects, elastomerics have had a, a fairly bad reputation in the in the in the field, um, over application and and really too much reliance on 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 the on the coating. Um, and permeability is actually one of the main gripes of uh, or the poor rep the bad reputation of elastomeric. Um, here, however, I can demonstrate that uh, Elasticolor Flex is 26.2 perms, which is actually even better than our Elasticolor coat. Um, and both of these products um, are carrying the SWRI validation, uh, which covers the, uh, the volume solids, breathability, uh, crack bridging, um, elongation, I believe, elongation and tensile strength as well. And we've gone to the extra length of uh, getting elastic color code approved in the MPI program as well. Um, stress a little bit more about um, elastic color code. Um, I'm at the risk of sounding like a Tom Selleck commercial, um, this isn't my first rodeo. Uh, I've been in the industry a very long time and um, the work we've done with elastic color code um, is, is exceptional. Um, on paper, I can prove to you that this is the best product in the marketplace today. Um, there, are, there, there are very few comparisons that would, uh, would hold a light to this. And for that reason, it has really become our, our workhorse program. Um, and here's some examples of some of the uh, larger projects we've worked on. But I want to point out specifically the, the three color applications there, um, bringing into the conversation the, uh, the slides I was discussing earlier about um, the reds and the yellows, the blues and the greens, how paint manufacturers will preclude these from being applied or dissuade you from using these in the exterior applications. However, we've got the knowledge and the um, chemical aptitude to be able to uh, tweak our formulations, control that distribution and provide you with these vibrant, high intensity, uh, organic colors, red, yellow, blue, in in very high um, UV scenarios. Elastic color paint is uh, more of a, an entry level or a price point. It's um, designed on the same resin package as elastic color coat. Um, still very high performance product, but really more for that uh, maintenance um, uh, maintenance application or where you want to convert a brand or uh, they, they, they perhaps the buildings up for sale or something like that. Elastic color texture, very attractive, um, uh, very attractive uh, textured coating, um, very useful in, in employed where uh, we've conducted some uh, facade repairs and we want to obscure some of those surface imperfections as well. Uh, our primers consist of a, uh, a clear primer sealer surface conditioner, um, promoting adhesion, um, over light dusting surfaces where we've got some of that um, dusting I, I mentioned earlier in the uh, early in the presentation and then elastic color primer AR which is uh, alkali resistant pigmented primer this will resist alkali conditions up to pH of 13 which is freshly poured concrete um, we can coat over um, hot stucco in uh, in as little as three days or go over poured in place concrete in 10 days it's tentable to approximate the uh, approximate the color of the top coat, so you've got that you've got that additional depth of color right there. Um, and then briefly, our, our project services. We're in terms of the coatings, we're more than happy to come out and write um, observation reports detailing current conditions of a building, recommendations for repair methods, products and specifications. Um, we we will can produce color renderings. Um, to give you an idea of what your project is going to look like after the application of the coating. Um, excellent color matching capability, as I'm, and I, I think I've uh, sung the praises there pretty pretty heavily. Uh, we can literally match any color. We've got very fast turnaround on samples and production, technical advice on product systems, and uh, specific application techniques as well. Uh, we can provide you with uh, applicator referrals if, that, if you need that. Um, we can support you with practical on-site product mock-ups, samples, installation training, you name it, we're, we're there to help you. Um, a 
at the end of the day, we want you to be satisfied with the, the decision you've made and that we're doing our bit to help you protect your investment. And of course, we do that and also in writing by um, providing um, the competitive warranty program with all our products or we can, uh, individual product warranties or we can provide a full single source system warranty, which includes sealant, concrete restoration products and, and coatings. And talking a little bit, last slide, about our project solutions. Um, we can provide concrete protection for uh, embedded steel reinforcement, concrete repair mortars, uh, obviously the protective and decorative coating systems, which I've been talking about in our, in our elastic color line, uh, sealants, crack repair materials, you know, which includes uh, epoxy injection or uh, closed cell polyurethane foam, uh, waterproofing, um, waterproofing systems, uh, above and below grade, um, structural repair uh, with uh, FRP systems, and even uh, parking deck uh, parking deck repair and epoxy polyurethane um, uh, traffic systems as well. So that, uh, that that's basically us in a in a nutshell. Um, I hope uh, I hope the information was was helpful and informative. Um, and uh, you know, it's been been ab my absolute pleasure to be here today. Um, thank you all very, very much for attending. And if you have any questions, I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll do my very best to try and answer them. Okay. Thank you, Rankin. Uh, we do have a question here. Which would be better for color durability, a base coat and a clear coat or a high gloss paint finish? Okay. Uh, some pros and cons on either side of that. Um, Maybe influenced a little bit by the uh, the substrate, um, but I think um, a concrete substrate particularly would be uh, better suited with a base coat clear coat system. And the reason I say that is that um, number one, we'll get to the color faster with a, a high PVC coating, high solids, um, so we can uh, yeah, so we can build that build that film so it it hides better. Um, it has all the permeability we need, uh, and then we put a clear coating on top. So then there's only one sort of low perm, uh, low perm piece in that system. Um, you know, color is probably better built up over. Uh, color is better built up in and faster in a flat finish because of that higher PVC. Um, you know, successive layers of a of a high gloss paint. Um, you know, they're all very low perms. So that's a cumulative effect, and I think that would be that would be uh, detrimental. I think a, a base coat, clear coat finish would be would be more suited. Okay. Uh, next question: With so much variation in the test data and performance claims by manufacturers, how can I be sure I'm getting a better product? Hmm. Um, good. Great question. Again, um, you know, it'll take a a little bit more time to delve into some of those, uh, some of the data manufacturers have presented. I've been doing this my, my whole my whole career, so I know what to look for. But um, you know, by doing that, you can reveal some inconsistencies in what they're saying through the data. But um, I think it would be reasonable to ask your uh, your paint and coatings rep um, for independent proof of their product. Um, and what, what makes it better than compared to B? Um, you know, you can also look for uh, additional credentials such as, um, you know, DOT specifications or, um, you know, SWR on MPI. They're really good ones, obviously. But um, you know, just see um, see how often that that uh, that that coding specifically is being being specified. And you can do things that on um, you know applications like uh, Insight, or I would imagine even something in within uh, Master Spec or uh, Master Format if you have access to that. Okay, uh, looks like the last question. How do you address the, la the lifetime warranties offered by some paint manufacturers? Mm. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's sad that, uh, you know, paint manufacturers have resorted to trading on life expectancy of a, of a, of a, of a, of a paint. Um, you know, it, it doesn't really speak to the quality of the product. It's just, hey, what's my risk factor in terms of selling you this product, and and uh, how, uh, you know, and how well that 
marketing spend works. Um, you know, it's important to read the fine print. Um, they're relying on you to retain that proof of purchase um, for as long as you've got that uh, that paint on your property. Um, those those uh, warranties are not transferable. Um, you have to be the resident in the house. Um, you know, there's uh, there are a couple couple of other uh, qualifications, but as I say, are important to important to review to understand that. And you know, the the remedy at the end of the day for a failure, a paint failure, uh, is for the manufacturer to um, just give you some more paint or refund your original purchase price, and you know, don't come back. Um, you know, and I think that's sort of a testament to the the cost or the value the manufacturer is actually placing in their product. You know, you've, you've invested heavily in painting your house, and what's the best solution I've got for you if uh, if it goes wrong? Yeah, have some more paint at free. So I, I think that that does speak volumes about um, you know the, the value of the value that they place on their on their product. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, is if there's any more questions. Um... You know, we've got a few moments, or if not, we can always uh, have you send your questions to Mape Digital at mape.com, as I mentioned before, and uh, we'll forward them on to Rankin, and uh, we're always happy to field them for you. Um, again, Rankin, thank you so much for an informative presentation, and thank you everybody for joining us today. I guess this will conclude today's webinar. Um, Again, we appreciate you spending time with us today out of your busy days. Uh, we will see you again next time. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.